Good morning, everyone. It is a gift to be together, especially after that beautiful service last night. Thank you so much to the team that prepared this year's service of the living tradition. I'm your General Assembly Music Coordinator, Emily Jaworski. Joining me, <laughs> thank you very much. Joining me on the keyboard for this morning's service is my friend Benji Messer. Later on, we will also be treated to original songs by the folk group Planted by Hands. They are members of the UU Church of Spokane, and they are Peggy Eckloff, Kelly Lugruda, and Dan Gore, and I can't wait for you to hear their beautiful music. For now, let us please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing our opening hymn, Our World is One World. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to introduce myself in a little bit. Right now, I am lending my voice to Rochelle Strother, a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, who late last night developed laryngitis. She and her extraordinary daughter, Sophia, drafted some wonderful introductory welcoming remarks today, some opening words, and in order to make sure that her mother has, her mother's words are at least present with us and with Sophia this morning, I'm going to go ahead and read them, but I want you to know that th this is Sophia's mom talking. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. My name is Rochelle Strother. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, and I am here with my daughter, Sophia. My name is Sophia Okumu, and I am 10 years old, and I have been attending the UU Church of Spokane with my mom since I was four years old. In preparing this opening reflection, we asked ourselves, what does the power of we really mean? Where have we seen and experienced this in our lives? While we see examples of togetherness all around us, our richest, most inspiring examples come from the country of Sophia's birth, Kenya. When I was a small child, I used to spend time in the village with my Kenyan grandparents, whom my cousins and I called Granny and Grandy. Their farm was simple with chickens running around, homes made out of caked mud, and I in a simple kitchen hut that was always smoking. They grew maize, which is like corn, 
sorghum, beans, and many different types of vegetables. Granny and Grandy had been teachers, and though they were not poor, they were certainly not rich. Still, they shared everything they had with everyone they knew. They took in children who had nowhere else to go, raised money for local children to go to school, and fed everyone to came, who came to their home. Even if it seemed like the food would be too little to feed everyone, Granny would say, we will share the little that we have. That is the Kenyan way. Sophia's Granny and Grandy had 10 children, and like many Kenyan families, the oldest child was expected to support the other siblings. Their oldest child, Benson, did well enough in school to get a government scholarship to university. And after graduating and becoming a teacher, he sent most of his salary home to his parents so they could pay school fees for the other children. After Benson's next sibling, Lillian, got through college, she did the same for her younger siblings, as did each one after another. All 10 of Granny and Grandy's children went to college or university and have supported siblings, nieces, nephews, and cousins to attend school as well. But this practice is not just for their family. This is simply the Kenyan way. Kenyans are always helping each other out. When someone passes away, neighbors and friends contribute money to the family members so that they can hold a really nice funeral for their loved one. When kids are getting ready to go for high school or college, but their families don't have enough money to pay for the school fees, friends and well-wishers will organize a harambe for them, which is like a fundraising party. For decades, Kenyan women have even been supporting each other's businesses by what they call merry-go-rounds, systems in which women pool their money to help each other on a rotational basis. So what does the power of we really mean? In Kenya, it means we are stronger together. It means that no one is an island. Everyone is part of something bigger. We now light this chalice as a symbol of our faith, of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and to cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Morning. Here's a little story we'd like to tell. I walk along the shore to watch the seabirds soar, listen to the waves caress the sand. Whether it's rough or calm those birds keep circling on ancient steady sentinels over land a single drop of dew shining on a leaf brand new reflecting Suspended in a sparkling tiny round. If I could fly, open wings and circle high, consider from a broader point of view. Mountains chase the rivers, cross the plains to kiss the sea. We're only bits of stardust, you and me. The wrinkles on my 
across the span of years around your eyes i see you live some just like me collection of your laughter love and tears if i could fly open wings and circle high consider from a broader point of view Mountains chase the rivers, cross the plains to kiss the sea. We're only bits of stardust, you and me. Every blade of grass, those birds, your dogs, your cat. Living by the wisdom of their kind. As sure as gravity, whether it rankle you or please, are by the stars naturally entwined. If, If I could fly, mountains change. Stardust, amazing as can be. We're only bits of stardust, you and me. Planted by hands like everyone you see on stage here this morning are locals from Spokane. Uh, they also all happen to be members of the Unitarian Church here. So this morning is the Spokane service and we are so delighted to be able to be here with you. Uh, my name is Todd Eckloff. I'm the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane and I do want to take a brief opportunity to welcome all of you to Spokane and tell you what a privilege it is to have you and the 2019 General Assembly here with us. Thank you for being here. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you a dear friend of mine, the Reverend Happy Watkins, who retired two years ago after serving Spokane's New Hope Baptist Church for nearly three decades. Happy, who was born in the Bronx 76 years ago, I hope you don't mind me telling your age, it's okay. I didn't get permission on that one. Uh, 52 years ago, moved to Spokane in 1961 while in the Air Force. An 18-year-old who was initially excited about the move until he found out Spokane is nowhere near D.C. <laughs> Fortunately for us, Happy fell in love in Spokane. He fell in love with Spokane, and Spokane fell in love with him, and he's made his home here ever since. In addition to his long ministry at New Hope, Reverend Watkins was a longtime chaplain at Deaconess Medical Center and Holy Family Hospital, but has endeared himself to many in our community and throughout the region for his memorization of Dr. Luther King's, Dr. Martin Luther King's cherished I Have a Dream speech, as well as many other speeches, which he's delivered thousands of times uh, in our region since 1986. In a recent interview, Happy said, I never met Dr. King, but I knew his struggle, the hatred, the discrimination, and for this reason, he doesn't try to imitate Dr. King when he delivers it. I put my own emotions into the speech, he says. What I most admire about Reverend Happy Watkins, however, is that he's always willing to
to put his own neck on the line to do what he believes is just and right. Like when he stood with me and other progressive faith leaders in our community to promote marriage equality in our state. and later to legalize marijuana, which has since cut the number of police stop and searches in half in Washington. <laughs> Issues that didn't always please the powers that be in his Baptist faith. He is an inspiration to so many, in so many ways and it is my great pleasure again and honor to introduce to you this morning my friend, the Reverend Happy Watkins. Eight years ago, I was minding my business. <laughs> I was in my Baptist box, and I thought I was doing a pretty good job. Then someone introduced me to Todd. and life has not been the same since. <laughs> it was Martin Luther King that said these words, I have the audacity to believe. People everywhere should have three meals for their bodies culture and education for their minds and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. The ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comforts and conveniences, but, but where they stand in moments of challenges and controversies. So I met this Todd fella at the Spokane Unitarian Universalist Church. And I had to go, when I did come, once every six weeks, I had to go to both services. And I'll tell you why. He's so deep. is that I couldn't get that first understanding at the nine o'clock service. <laughs> so I went to the 11 o'clock service. I didn't get it all, so then I had to call him during the week. <laughs> Todd spent a lot of time with me as a Baptist pastor. And I sat in his office, and boy, he is deep. Now, this other stuff, he always invited me to panels, marijuana stuff, <laughs> equality in marriage, smart justice. He would call me and say, happy, come down. I." There's a political party that we need to oppose. Just come. He took his time with me. And let me tell you something, my, as you might know, may not know, I had a small church. And we were in the process of trying to build. And I went to Todd 
and his congregation raise the first $5,000 plus. Y'all don't hear me. I wish, I wish I was on my east side where I'm from because people respond. It's kind of like uh, if you follow baseball, Ichiro hits a home run and you cheer, but in this case, Todd has hit a grand slam. <laughs> then I have a friend of mine who was the pastor and the president of the Minister's Fellowship Union which consists of mostly African-American pastors. And it is I and he, we, have tried to get a great understanding about people and religion. And we've done a great job, not as complete, but we're almost there. And, and, and I say that because I say that because if I could give an award, I wanted to go to this Todd fellow. <laughs> he has helped me immensely. <laughs> you see, in our congregation, Walter, right? We, or the pastor, is it. We, we, we're at the top of the mountain. We're everything. But then I met this Todd fella, and he got me involved with all kind of issues. Some I understood and some I didn't understand. We, we, we held hands as the railroad was going across and some coal, and I didn't, I thought I was coal going to do, it, do good, and we had to oppose that. <laughs> Todd, not only though, had, he's invited me to his house, met his beautiful wife, I want to say with a heart full of gratitude, I'm thankful for Spokane Church because they have helped me. And, and, and by the way, they're still sending donations a year or two after. A little boy went to church with his dad, and he said, Dad, what does it mean when the pastor opens up the Bible? And he said, well, he's going to read the scripture. What does it mean when he opens up the hymn book? Well, he's going to sing songs. And what does it mean when he take off his watch? Nothing at all, son. Nothing at all. <laughs> As I begin to close, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. I want to shout today his truth is marching on. I want to tell this convention, don't give up on us. We want a partnership for there is power in the we.
If Martin Luther King was here, he would say these words as I close again. <laughs> I sought my soul, and my soul I could not see. I sought my God, and my God eluded me. I sought Todd, <laughs> and I found all three. Amen. I didn't realize I was such a bad speaker. You have to listen to it twice and still come to me for questions. <laughs> All right, I've got to find our closing words here. I'm just going to share yours. So our, our closing reflection takes us back to Kenya. In 1977, a well-educated woman from the highlands of central Kenya noticed how deforestation was leading to drought, poverty, and less biodiversity. She was compelled to do something about this problem, but knew that she could not do it alone. She obtained a small grant and began paying a group of women to collect seeds in the forest plant them in tin cans, and replant them in deforested areas. These efforts continued on a small scale for five years until she received a much bigger grant that would allow her to compensate thousands of women for planting new trees. Forests began to rejuvenate all over Kenya. This woman was Wangari Mathai. She died in 2011 from cancer. Her tree planting initiative, known as the Green Belt Movement, has to this day benefited 9,000 women and led to 45 million trees being planted across Africa. <laughs> Just as Wangari brought women together in her mission of saving the environment, so can all of us all of us harness the power of we to create a better world. As the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We now extinguish this chalice, but not the power of we that it represents. Go in peace. <laughs>